Uh, the call is meeting of the Madison Select Board to order on Monday, September 28, 2020, 6.30 p.m. to join me to salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to a republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let the record show all select and present. Uh, consent agenda warrant number... 9-9-14-2020, payroll register number 37-9-10-2020, number 38-9-17-2020, and number 39-9-24-2020. So moved is read. Second. We have a motion and a second to accept the, accept the warrant from payroll register as read. All, any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? All in favor, the motion carries. We have a liquor license for Pete's Pig Southern Barbecue uh, out of Oakland, Maine, and they are catering a wedding at Fairy Tale Gardens uh, on the 20, uh, the 10th of, the 10th of October, 2020. Looking for a motion to accept, or to grant, I guess. I have a motion and a second to approve the uh, liquor license for Pete's Pigs Southern Barbecue LLC. And it does say there will be 50 people in attendance. All right. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? All in favor, the motion carries. Uh, Acceptance of the meeting minutes of uh, September 14, 2020. Any motion to approve? A motion and a second to approve the meeting minutes of September 14, 2020. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? All in favor, the motion carries. All business. Mr. Savage? Nothing. Mr. Wyatt? Nothing. Mr. Gokin? Nothing. Mr. Moody? Nothing. Items of communication, Mr. Town Manager? All right, a couple of things. Um, picking up on some of the selectmen's concerns from the last meeting. I met with Marty Berry from MEW and we talked about the lamp posts that go down Main Street and there, there are three missing lamp posts. And I believe he told me that the lamp that was out in front of Economy Trophy has been replaced. Yes. So that light's back on. Yep. But there are three posts that are just missing the whole post altogether. Um, Marty told me that they have reached out to the company that manufacture them. At one point they thought they were out of business, but now they're back in business, but then they kind of shut down and scaled back for COVID. So Marty plans to always have in stock three poles and three light units so that he can replace them as needed as they go. Um, but at, at this point they're just waiting to get in touch with the company to, to order them. So that's their plan. They, they do plan on replacing those poles that are, are just completely gone down to the stump. Uh, while we were talking, we talked about Christmas lights. If you're familiar with the pole-mounted Christmas lights the town annually puts up down Main Street, um, those have surpassed 20 years old now. And uh, those are old, what do they call that, incandescent bulbs. So they're not LEDs. And they're, the wiring started to go and they're starting to fray. So Marty and Scott Lloyd looked at all those different ones. And you're probably familiar with them. There's snowmen and there's, right. there's stars and all these other things. Um, there's 45 of them, and they, they think they can salvage about 10 for this year. So I told Marty, I said, just pick certain places, the town office, MEW, maybe over by the library. Don't, don't bother trying to do every poll downtown. And I talked to the company that, that makes those lights. Um, you know, they have a sale after Christmas. So they have a sale in January and February. Um, now, for LEDs, you're talking $800 per light uh, that maybe you can get for $500 on sale in January or February. So, after talking with Marty and Scott, they recommend maybe not such big lights, maybe doing some of the smaller, because some of those lights are six feet tall, maybe going with four feet tall, a little different lights. So, just, just so you're aware, that that's coming. Uh, in, the, in the new year. Um, on Pine Street, we, I'm sorry. Can I ask? Yep. 
Yeah. Okay. There are no are no lights in the wintertime when we get town down from Main Street. Those are big lights, and they do block those. That's yeah. just real soft metal that was on those poles. And I tell you, if they yeah, uh, you need some small ones. Sure, sure. You're talking about the Christmas ones that right, hang. Yeah. Yeah. Those things are huge. Yeah, Marty and Scott said the same thing. They can't even put on those poles. Yeah. They're too big. So I think it's time to obviously relook and reschedule those in, in the spring. On Pine Street, we did find a couple of street lights out, and they've they've addressed those uh, from the concern on Pine Street. Um, so, despite all the work that the town of Man Madison and the town of Anson did to listen to Eagle Creek's uh, concerns about their uh, assessment and to make adjustments and lower them. Um, Jonathan Block, the attorney for Eagle Creek now, has filed the 2020 abatement of Eagle Creek's taxes. And um, it, it is what it is. It'll just, it, it'll just continue. Uh, in, if you ask my opinion from looking at it, I believe what he's trying to do is he's trying to mirror what he thinks the Madison paper valuation should have been in 2016 by lowering the Eagle Creek valuation, and so that he, he has a, kind of a symmetry between both cases. Um, talked to our attorney today, Dave Silk, and we're probably looking at June to December of 2021 before any of these get to the court system. So as assessors in October, on October 19th, you'll have an assessors meeting at 5.30, and you'll get to see that abatement. Uh, if you'd like to see it now, I can certainly send it to you. Uh, but it's, you know, it's pretty cut and dry. Um, we believe, after talking with Anson, Anson's attorney, our attorney, Shirley, and I, we believe it's a pretty cut and dry case. We all covered our bases uh, with this. We used the data they asked us to use. So it's, it's silly, but it's just more legal stuff that we've got to go through. Was well, that something when we deal with that in the 19th? Where we have uh, people here from Eagle Creek, John from Block. And, uh, if you want to, now uh, you can hold a hearing and ask them to come and make their case. Anson's not doing that because they've already gone over all the numbers with Eagle Creek. And we have, and we have two via those yeah. Zoom meetings that you participated in. Yeah. So I don't think, based on our lawyer's advice, I don't think it's necessary to have a hearing. You'll have a, a couple of choices. You can either just take no action and it will be deemed denied, or you can just flat deny it and then we send a letter off and the process goes to the state board. Okay. Um, Any questions on that? Yeah, I put the force on. And I just want to make a communication. Obviously, those who are here at the meeting tonight can see it. But the progress continues on for uh, utilizing this space as an election and voting space at the Old Point School. Um, the painting is being done. <laughs> the room is open. Uh, there's a, a wheelchair ramp that started on this side. And all the electrical work inside has been done. Uh, probably within the next week, the electrical work on the outside, putting floodlights in the parking lot, that'll be complete. Um, and the flooring throughout here in the hallway will be uh, complete. Uh, I, I will say that's we're ending up spending on this phase about forty thousand dollars of that. Keep in mind, about twenty-five was the parking lot. Uh, and I will uh, give kudos to Kathy and and uh, and Tammy for lining things up for grants. We've received about eleven thousand dollars worth of grants to cover some of those expenses. We couldn't get grants for the parking lot, but if you look at it this way. That parking lot was scheduled for next year or the year after, so we really just moved it up on the on the capital uh, plan. Um, any of that, any of that money, basically COVID type money, I mean, is that is that stuff we're going after? Actually, two of those grants are part of the Keep Me Healthy. Uh, we received nine thousand dollars from from that source, and then uh, Kathy got another one that was run through MMA and the the uh, Secretary of State office specifically for elections. Because we're not the only town having to change where their election site is. There's, there's quite a few uh, going on. So once the, once the ballots are available, elections, elections will open up here? Right. 
in, in October? Is that what, is that what the plan is? So the plan right now is that by the week of October 5th, all the towns should have the ballots. And so people that are requesting absentee ballots can actually come down here at that time. Kathy will be staffed here with a, with a, a temporary election clerk. So there'll be people here that voters can come, fill out their form for their absentee ballots, and actually vote here, mm -hmm. and then submit the absentee ballot in the box. People can come down here to register to vote anytime. Uh, and so basically this will become election headquarters for pretty much the month of October into November. So that's, that's, within the, that's within the scope of the day, 7.30 or 8 o'clock till, till 4 o'clock or 3.30. Or yeah. 3 is, that what, is that what you're planning on? And that's Monday through Friday? Yes. Okay. So people want to know that. And we'll do our best to, uh, to help get the word out. Uh, Kathy is chomping at the bit to do a live or, in, or a video with, oh, with, with uh, uh, Channel 11 awesome. that we can broadcast all <laughs> over Facebook, I'm sure. <laughs> You just address my okay. question. All right. How we were going to put them forward. All right, and that is all I have for communication. Any other questions for the time manager? There I go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Kathy, you want to put up some posters? Yeah. Okay, and I'll, I'll put them up down here because that's really where all the problems are going to happen. If people go to the town office, they can direct them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, new business, discuss draft pandemic policy. So you should all have this in your packet. Um, and two things to note. This is a draft, and this was put together not to be a response to COVID-19. If you notice, it's COVID-19 is not really mentioned in this. This is a broader, more general policy of what the town should do if you decide to implement this in, in cases of uh, flu-like symptoms or what they refer to as an influenza-like illness referred to as an ILI, just to use another acronym that we don't know what it means. Um, so I was going to go down through this briefly and just pause and see if any of the staff members or any of the select board members had questions uh, or concerns. I think items one, two, and three are pretty self-explanatory. So I'll jump down to, if it's okay, item four, which is application on the first page. So this policy applies to all employees of the town, including elected officials. In the case of a pandemic flu-like outbreak in our community and or central Maine, department heads will be responsible for monitoring the health and job vacancy rates caused by the spread of the virus. The goal is to continue to provide a high level of service to Madison residents. However, the town may be forced to look at alternative staffing levels and or an adjustment to work schedules if the vacancy uh, rates escalate. In addition, department heads may, be, may consider reassignments and covering vacancies with other capable employees. Any decision to close places of gathering will be based on guidance from the main CDC. So I'll, I'll pause there and see if there's any questions or comments about that. It's essentially a summary of what we did this past spring in, in March and April, where we adjusted work schedules. Those of us who could work from home work from home. Um, the highway part department took a, a two-week hiatus and then they came back and worked uh, essentially into spring cleanup, uh, but they were able to work individually and in, in, in individual trucks and so forth. Um, so any, any questions or comments on the application of this policy? Sounds good. So flipping the page to section five, the employee's responsibility is if you are experiencing this type of illness, if you feel sick, if you've got a sore throat, if you've got a fever, you must stay home from work until 24 hours after your fever has subsided. This means no fever without the use of medication. If you su suspect you've been exposed to someone who has tested positive or is showing symptoms, report that possible exposure to your department head. You're not responsible for informing coworkers. 
Each scenario will be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Each employee situation will be handled in a manner deemed appropriate for that time in accordance with CDC guidelines. And again, we've all heard a lot about the response to COVID-19. This is a more general, broad approach to a pandemic in general. So we're assuming if we run into another pandemic in the future, the CDC will give us those guidelines on when you can come to work, when you can't come to work. The common sense here is don't come to work if you feel sick. Um, and, and as uh, the employer, we obviously have to deal with that, which leads into Section 6, Supervisor Responsibility. Supervisors must be diligent to watch for employees who appear sick. If you suspect an employee has an illness, the best way to verify this is to ask the employee whether or not they're running a fever. If the employee believes they are running a fever, they should be sent home and should receive medical clearance prior to returning to work. This does put a burden on department heads and, and supervisors. So, any comments or questions? Jeff? Well, first of all, I, I just think this policy is, is way too much government interference, okay? That's my opinion. Second of all, I'm not interested in being a doctor, okay? And to tell, for me to tell an employee to go home, I don't feel is right. Okay, that should be up to the individual person to stay home and be sick and not come to work. Okay, and going to the doctor to get a release to come back to work, you know how hard it is to get a doctor's appointment to begin with, to even walk in the door, to let alone get a, a, a note to come back to work. So that employee has to lose up to two or three days if that person has a common cold, an allergy, you know, where do you draw the line? Is what I'm asking. Well, I think the reason they, I think the reason they do this is because they just don't want to spread it to the other employees. Well, I understand that. And it's just like uh, just like the flu. I mean, that could that should be coming around pretty soon. And the same thing with flu. I mean, we got the same problem. I mean, school coming times out and been in school, and there's been 40 kids out. So, yeah, I mean, school still goes on, they still come to school every day. You ask people, and the school goes away. But, and, you know, and that's just the way things are, but it's, you're right, it's up to the individual, but however, if the individual doesn't want to go home, that's something then. I think this is this is what we did this this spring. I mean this whole thing, I mean pretty much reading it through was what, what happened this spring. And I think it's I think I agree with Mr. Gopin. If you feel that the employee is sick and they, they are acting that way, then I think it's within our our responsibility to to send them home. I mean, I don't think we want everybody there. I mean, we were very lucky that nobody nobody came down with anything in the spring. But, I mean, we had nothing really. I mean, we were kind of flying off the, we were kind of flying, you know, off the cuff here this spring and figuring out what exactly to do at the town. But eventually we're, we're going to run into this. Eventually we're going to have employees that get sick with something. Right whether it's just the flu or whether it's allergies and everybody's very hypersensitive right now if you've got a sore throat and a cough and you feel under the weather you know our message is you stay home mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess what I, I see where Jeff's coming from in his role as a department head in the foreman's role of, of the crew in the librarian's role uh, with her staff you know, are, are, are they going to be comfortable saying, I think you're sick, go home? And that's, that's a tough call to make. The other side of that, though, is if that person comes to you and says, I don't feel good and I want to go home, and oh, you, say, you right. say, tough it out, get back, in the, get back in the job and finish it out. Exactly. That, that, to me, is a little bit much. Right. 
And, and that's, that's something I don't think we can do in, in this age. Right. Well, I was going to say, those days are gone. Right. 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 I, I don't, I, I wish I agreed with you, but. I, well, <laughs> well, I think po policy-wise, those you, days have to be. Yeah, right. Unless, unless you got rules, I don't know if you're going to be able to do that. Is there any other question? I, I understand where Jeff's coming from, and it's any, any type of a policy is better than no policy at all. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think if you use it as a guideline, and, because, and why I say that is because by being a supervisor or a leader of any group of people, you have a responsibility to those people and if you're not making yourself aware of whether it's this, system, this situation or another, there is a, being a supervisor, you're standing under a vicarious liability umbrella. And I think this will kind of, kind of support you somewhat uh, as far as the supervisors go, the department heads go, but I don't think I don't think you should read into it too hard that it's locked in stone. I think it's I think if it's used as a as a basic guide for you, so that you can say, well, you know, I did follow the guide procedures. Uh, it's it's I don't think it's black and white. It doesn't appear to be black and white, but there's got to be some some responsibility there somewhere. And I think if it's used as a guideline, I think everybody. You know, will fare pretty well as far as this goes. I mean, you're going to have to have something. So this is better than nothing. Okay. On the HR side of it, um, you have to look at we're sending people home because they're sick. Are they sick because they have the COVID? Are they sick because of the flu? And sometimes flu can last for several days, past the three-day window. In our policy, if you're out for three days you get a doctor's note, or you start family medical leave. So that puts me at saying, oh, it's only really a flu. Do I, do I have to go the extra step in my paperwork to follow these guidelines? That's another thing to think about. I, and, and medical note, I'm home. I go home on a Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I'm sick. I just need a, another half day, I tell Tim. To, you know, I still have a headache, but I'm feeling pretty good. That's past my three days. We've done that in the past, that, you know, I'm feeling better, but I just need another day to get fully rested. At what point am I not following my job? So. Um, I agree with what you said, Tammy, except most places that way, anything after three days, you have to have the doctor's permission to come back. But I think what they did at this time was pretty easy. I've been to numerous places, East of Maine, over at um, down at Togus and some other places around. And that's all they do. They bring you in, you got your mask on, they ask you three questions, and then they just wipe, make sure you don't have a temperature more than 101, and, yet, and then they let you in. I mean, there isn't anything big deal about it. I mean, you could do the same thing if it came back again, and Jeff doesn't want to send him home, so he comes in and just check him, check him with that little gun, it can't cost that much. If they got 101, they go home. They have to go get a doctor. They have to go get walk and a doctor's permission. I mean, come back. These people are going to use their sick time, okay? They can't get into the doctor for two more days. So, you know, you get to the point where do they have sick? They don't have sick. That's right. But you, usually what they've been doing now, you get one in scouring the ground, you set your car and they just come in and swab it in. But it takes four days to get the which I don't think will be that long afterwards. But you, there'll be an easy way, I hope, like like they have now, just taking the temperature. As long as they stay on 101, they're fine. I, I just, I, I agree with Jeff. I think that this is difficult to, if you if you read it and you about, think you have to abide by every bit of it. It's a, it's a plan. It's a policy like a personnel policy mm -hmm. or any type of policy. Um, obviously, you need to, if you're in doubt, check with your supervisor, whoever is in charge, to give you advice on it. Um, I agree with Ms. Moody. It is, it's a guide. I don't think we want to get too tied up in all the details of it, except to be sure that we're trying to handle it correctly. Um, and this is all going to be, it's a moving target anyway. Mm -hmm. It will change as time goes on. 
I, I hope we're not getting confused here. This policy is a pandemic virus policy. I hope we don't get it mm -hmm. confused with just a basic sickness. You know, colds mm -hmm. and sneezes and stuff of that nature, or not feeling well, cramps or what have you. You know, I, you know, I, I hope we're not getting this confused. This is this here is for a pandemic. Right. This is not for your everyday right. cold or yes, yeah, we're not feeling the, well. Unfortunately, we're in that pandemic phase. So, mm -hmm. I, is it a regular cold, like Jeff was saying? Is it a regular flu, or is it seasonal? Those are the guidelines that he was. I I understand, I understand I understand that, but in in those parameters, mm -hmm. you know, one leak can look like the other. But I'm talking about all your other sickness problems. Don't bring that into this pandemic policy. That stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, done. Do we have a problem with people coming to work sick? Yes. Yeah. I, I think over the years it's been something that people have done, and they, they've. And I, I think part of it is before COVID, we all had this work ethic that's like, I'm just going to push through it. So, and like like Sally said, I think it's a different world now. It, it is the only other comment I got. I mean, we talk about temperatures and not feeling well, but if you listen to the news every night, they say there's thousands of people out there that have no symptoms whatsoever. Right. So we're, you, you're, it doesn't right. make sense. And we can, but we can only govern what we can see. We can't see it. But that, and that's why the policy only governs if you identify somebody has some symptoms. And I, I think the reference I circled here that we've been talking about is this idea of medical clearance. And really, I, I think I recommend just leaving that vague because medical clearance is going to mean different things. During a pandemic, it may mean going and get swabbed and getting a test. Uh, outside a pandemic, it may mean just making an appointment to go to your doctor or go to a health clinic and just make sure that you're not don't run, not running a fever anymore. So. All right, any other questions up to number six? All right, vote seven. Yeah, the other hot topic is travel. Uh, and again, this, this segment is very vague and intentionally open-ended. Um, in the event of an uh, outbreak in the community or central Maine town, business travel would be suspended. We normally don't have a tremendous amount of business travel. In the event that an employee travels outside the state or to an area designated as a hot spot by the CDC, employees may be required to quarantine upon return. Employees on travel-related quarantine may be required to work from home if uh, practicable. Um, you know, I, I, I'll leave it up to anybody who has any comments or questions on, on that in regards to travel. There again, too much government intervention. <laughs> Telling you where you can go, where you can't go. You know, don't, don't, we, don't we have a responsibility to protect the town? Yes, I mean, if you, if, if you are a supervisor and I'm, a, I'm your employee and I'm afraid to say I'm sick, I want to go home. If I'm afraid for my job, then I'm going to work sick. But if you're, if, and I'm afraid, and, I, and I'm afraid of you, as my employer or my supervisor, and I come to you and I say I'm sick, and you say, ah, oh, something, I'll go back to work. How, how do you get out of that? How do you get that? How do you get to the point where you're going to say, okay, go home? That's fine, not a problem. I mean, I, I don't, I, I just think we have to protect the town from saying, somebody coming back and saying, well, he wouldn't let me go. Yeah, so I'm sorry. We have an outbreak in town then. Right. It was caused by an employee who had symptoms and was able to continue working. And I mean, it was pretty serious. And I, you know, I just can't, I'm, I'm wearing a mask today because we were picked up last week at the other meeting about not wearing masks at our, at our meetings. Um, and I'm not going to do that anymore. I, it, I know it, it's everybody's choice, but we need to look out for the community. Anything else on travel? Any comments on travel? We don't go very far anyway, so. <laughs> other than maybe in the pickup truck. To... Well, this is this is in regards to people taking vacation and traveling too. Oh. Yeah. So this isn't just work. This does mention work-related travel, but this also is, is. It's the only place in this policy that covers this idea of if you go 
to see your family in Oklahoma, what happens when you come back? And so it simply says here, you may be required to quarantine a month upon return. The reason that's not specific is because, again, this is a pandemic policy. And even now in this COVID world, the requirements on quarantining are, are changing. Um, we have some employees that could work a staggered schedule, some employees that could work from home. We have other employees that can't. Their job just doesn't allow them to work from home. But in some cases, we do. So that's why I just leave it as vague as possible and say, let's try to work it out with your supervisor, with a department head, with HR, a town manager, and figure out what we're going to do in this particular case. I am not in favor uh, of coming in with a hard line policy as some communities have that says, you will be gone for 14 days and you will use your vacation time to do it. Because in that sense, that's hard if you put that in writing. If a person has accumulated two or three weeks of vacation, they go for two or three weeks, now you're going to ask them to take two more weeks of vacation and, and stay home? Uh, I just don't want to put that in, in writing at this point. I think, you know, I think as the employee, though, know, you, you have to have some sort of thought process in where you're going if it's a hot spot, then maybe I'm not going there. But, I mean, everything in New England now is opened up, so everything in New England you can go to, right? All the New England states. But that's, but that's, a, that's the employee's choice. Right. But and, the and that's the employee's decision. That, that shouldn't be a self, something right. like no, policy. That, no, what I'm saying is employee, I have to use some common sense. But if an employee comes to me and says, I'm going to go see my grandchild in Louisiana, yep. Then, no, we, then we're going to have to walk through right. that as a team right. as to how that employee returns to work when they come back. The, then, then, then the employer, the, the employee that does that, has two choices: quarantine for 14 days, which is recommended by the CDC, or go, go have the damn test. Right. Either or. And once once you've got that documentation, then you. Then they're saying you're fit to go back to work. But that's the scenario right now. Yes. I didn't want to put that in this policy because that's not governing what the future situation may be. I understand what you're saying, but this policy says pandemic virus policy. Right. It doesn't say sickness policy. Right. Right. It's just a pandemic yes. policy. Yeah, and normally this wouldn't apply if there wasn't a pandemic of some sort, the there travel restrictions. Yes. Right. Okay. There's no more questions on, on travel. Have, oh. It was fine because uh, at the very beginning of this, that the, if you travel from Maine to Florida, once you get to Florida, or if you flow, came from Florida to Maine, you have to quarantine for 14 days. So there's a couple weeks right there you just lost. When you go back to Florida from Maine, you got to quarantine again. For, so there's, 20, there's a month you lost. I mean, it's just kind of ridiculous that some of these policies they have. The other items, such as employer responsibility, universal precautions, are pretty straightforward. The last item, item 10, is meetings. Um, and I, I worded this that the meetings will continue as, practi uh, you know, as practical as possible. Um, attendance limits, uh, spacing limits. Uh, I believe that we are in compliance with the state and CDC guidelines because everyone is spaced six feet apart. Um, if we weren't all spaced six feet apart, then I believe masks would be the, the next step. Um, and remote meeting options, I think will continue. I think we're going to have remote meeting access as, as a standard procedure going forward. Um, I, I commend the planning board because I think they've done an excellent job. Uh, continuing to function and doing over a dozen site reviews um, by, by Zoom. And I, I think they've done an excellent job. So th this is a draft, um, and now I, I present it to you and, and looking for feedback from the board as to where, where to move on this. Any questions? Any? I know this is going to sound silly, Yep. Um, under employer responsibility, should you include masks in that group of 
We will provide masks, yes. Yep. Providing them, is, I, I don't think that right. would be an issue. And that is that is a practice that we've already done. So. Mm -hmm. Are we looking to accept this tonight, or are we looking to hold it off for another meeting? <clears throat> Anybody want to make a motion? Or we want to hold it off for another meeting? Um, sure, go ahead. Question. Um, if we vote on this tonight, does this come in effect? It's a policy, and you as the board have the authority. It's not an ordinance. It doesn't need to go to town meeting. So you as the, as the board have the authority to, mo to motion it and approve it, and it will go into effect as of tomorrow. Or you can put it in effect today. Or you can say January 1st or something like that. Okay. Or are you just going to add this to our personal policy in the bathroom? It could be an addendum to the personnel mm -hmm. policy, yep. Yeah. I'll make a motion on the Okay. Give a second. I'll go with a second on it just for discussion. All right. We have a motion and a second to accept the pandemic virus policy. Any questions, Mr. Gokin? I'm waiting to see if anybody else, if anybody else was quiet. I just wondered what was, why was it so quiet? All right. I think it's some. I personally think it's something we need for the for the town to have in its in its back pocket, I guess, to have for this type of situation if it ever happens again. And if you want to make it, if you want to make it so it doesn't take effect until January first, then I don't have a problem with that either. But it, it is. I think it protects the town. It gives us it gives the town manager some guidelines on how we're going to go about things. I mean. In March, we flew by the sea of our pants and trying to figure out exactly what's going on. You know, I said close him. He said he said let's wait. Next phone call, he said let's close. So I mean, it, it was it was quite crazy there for a bit, and what to do with people. Um, but I I think it's something we need. I agree. So I think I, we need, and as Tim said, we just add it to the personnel policy as a, as a, it is just a, it's a pandemic. It's not a health benefit. Sick policy or anything else, we can cover that in the personnel policy. Mm -hmm. But just to have it in place in the event that something comes up and we don't have it, we might be in trouble. So. Just so, I mean, our return to work thing at the school is 23 pages, so that's pretty, uh, that's pretty invasive. <laughs> <laughs> so, three pages is too bad. Any other question? Uh, I'll direct this to the town manager. Is this is this a policy policy that you think that the town can live with as far as the town manager's responsibilities? The way it's written leaves enough leeway for us to look at each case on a case by case basis, um, and that's the way I've always liked to approach things. And so. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable we could work within the parameters of this. And, 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 I'm, and I'm comfortable with this as, as long as the understanding is, this is, again, I'll repeat it, it's a pandemic virus policy. It's not a sickness policy right. that we have already organized in, in our right. policies. And as long as, as that, uh, if that's recognized, I don't have a problem with this. Right. Any other questions? Any others? All right, seeing none, all those in favor of the pandemic virus policy? All right, I will vote yes, not opposed. All right, we have four to one, Mr. Savage opposed. It is the vote. Thank you. Uh, just one more idea. So when is this going to affect? In, in the motion, there wasn't any mention to when it should be in effect. So we, we can add it to our personnel policy this week. Okay. The only, the only concern I have, if, if you're going to do it right off, is I think that they should just, that little gun tells you what the temperature is, and you're fine, okay, do more today. We didn't outline that, but that is an option that we could use. Right. All right. 
and now and now we just take the burden off from you. And Arthur Jeff and right. whoever else has to be tested. The librarian who's ever in charge over there. Yep. And and I think I can speak for the department heads to say that that's coming as a suggestion from you. It's not coming as part of this right. that you right. just passed. Right. Okay. All right. Number two, discuss proposed regulation of needle exchange programs. So if you recall over in East Madison, the sheriff, as part of his report, talked about the ordinance that the town of Skowhegan passed at their late uh, August town meeting to regulate needle exchange programs. So what I put in your packet, if you had a chance to look at it, is it's five or six pages long. It is Skowhegan's ordinance. I, I will not go through this in detail tonight. That's why I made this sheet here that just is basically a one-page summary of the notes regarding the uh, needle exchange program. Um, so I learned some, some background about how this all got started. It started with this, the main CDC. And the main CDC had funding to give to an organization who wanted to operate a needle exchange program based on the fact that the CDC wants to lessen the spread of diseases like HIV and hepatitis C through, through dirty needles. So this started with the CDC saying, hey, we have funding. The CDC noticed that one of the high rates of needle usage was in the Skowhegan area. So the CDC approached Reddington Fairview and their public health outlet, which is Somerset Public Health, um, they also talked to Maine General. And Ready to Fairview, Fairview says, no, we don't want to oversee a needle exchange program. Somerset Public Health said, no, we don't want to. Maine General said, we will if no one else does it. So that left the window open for this main access points, referred to as MAP. Main access points, that's the, the entity that the sheriff referred to in the last meeting to say, we'll do it. So they stepped forward, took the funding from the CDC, and started their approach to the needle exchange programs. And the concerns that the sheriff brought up were shared by the Skowhegan Select Board, and, and that's why they brought this, this, uh, this ordinance to, to light. Um, one thing that's worth noting is that uh, as part of the governor's executive orders, uh, needles can be exchanged through the mail which is a new uh, thing. So, that, and that, that's a whole other thing that this, this ordinance does not deal with mail needle exchanges. So, here's what I recommend and you tell me what you want to do. Um, I do not recommend drafting the exact same ordinance that Skowhegan drafted. Um, I believe in, you know, to their credit, they were trying to deal with something on the fly, and they put together something that's probably going to be challenged. Um, it, the, my understanding is the State Attorney General is reviewing this ordinance to see what, if anything, needs to be updated or changed. Um, I would like to take a, an approach where we see what the Attorney General's office comes up with, and we work with an entity like Somerset Public Health that they're good at policy making and they can kind of go through this and, and take a look at both sides of the issue and help us craft an ordinance if that's what the board wants to do. Of course the board could say, you know, we don't need an ordinance and then I just drop it. So now, have we heard anything at all from this the needle exchange program? Anybody anybody contacted Madison? No. No? But I don't know if they necessarily would. So one day we just we'll just come and we'll have a needle exchange program, and if we don't set up some sort of ordinance, this is one of the this is one of the reasons I want to talk with Somerset Public Health because they have folks that are in contact with main access points, yep. and maybe they can kind of bring some people together to find out what is your plan, and and how would you how are you planning to go forward? I think it was. The dialogue was done poorly with the sheriff, and I think that led to this knee-jerk reaction from the town of Skowhegan. Uh, but I, I think we can utilize the, the assets that we have here uh, to try to put something together. All right. Do we see any reason to move? 
Yeah, I have a big problem with that. I don't think we need it in this town, number one. Num num number two... An, an ordinance? This right here, ordinance. yes, this needle exchange. So you, you're saying we don't need needle exchange programs? That's right. You're, okay. Right. That's, what I, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. The state has, has all kinds of wonderful ideas, but they usually don't have the money or the manpower to do it, so it flows downhill into the counties and towns and, and, and the other areas to take care of these things. You've, it sounds to me like you've already got one of these programs right down the road in Skowhegan, and you've got a number of medical area programs that don't want anything to do with it, and I don't know why this town, or we would want this in our town right now, if there was a great need for us to address something, that would be something else. But I don't think the people in this town would be happy if we said uh, down here on the corner on Wednesdays that everybody can go down there and swap needles. No, I, think, I think that's what we're trying to avoid. Right. Yeah. We're trying to avoid that type of setup and to set up an, an ordinance that says you can only do it in these places. I, I, I know what you're saying. And I don't, I don't agree with having it in any of these places in this town. So that's what I'm, I'm against. If, if I'm hearing Mr. Moody correctly, you would actually be in favor of a prohibition ordinance. Yes. That would prohibit needle exchange. In this, in this town, yeah, the town of Madison. That's not what this is from Skowhegan. They didn't do a prohibition. They did a regulation. I, I so understand I just, that. Want to make sure that we're all on the same thing. I understand that, but we are looking at something that another town is doing and, and is going along with, and I don't go along with what this is all about. Gotcha. Sometimes you're hard to read. <laughs> I get very polite and <laughs> ask the question. <laughs> all right, so I guess. Right. Um, yeah, I just have a comment. Uh, when the chair was talking about this, and I agree with him at, at the beginning, when he was helping these people go get the doctor, go to the hospital and stuff. I agree with you. But when you go to a needle exchange, these people are not looking for help. They're looking for a safe way to do their drug. Right. And to me, that's an enabler, which is we could end up being that, or like Scott Wiggins is going to be, I feel. And I, I agree with Mr. Moody. I don't, I don't agree with this program at all. But that's just me. Okay. And, it, and it's also... Okay. They, they approached Skyhegan, is it the MAP? Well, actually, the CDC gave funding to main access points. Okay. And the CDC had already targeted Skyhegan as the, oh, the next best place to do this. Yeah. So it, it, it wasn't like somebody was sneaking around. The CDC said, we've got a problem in this part of the state, this part of the state, and this part of the state. Right. And Skyhegan was the next one. Well, we'll be the kind of seat in the largest, you know, the largest right. municipality. So probably right. that's fine. But um, I agree that we don't need that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I don't think we need it anywhere. To be honest. We're, we're heading to a different kind of ordinance. Now. Right, and I, I appreciate this. That's why we have this discussion. So you're not, if I'm getting the gist, you're not looking for a regulation ordinance. You'd actually like to see a, a prohibition ordinance. And whether that's constitutional or not, I don't know. But those are the things that I can try to find out and bring back to the board. I think that, I think that, what we're trying to, by having an ordinance, what we're trying to, to, to do is that main access point shows up in our town office tomorrow and says, Tim, we're, we're going to set up in X, Y, and Z places. He's going to say, okay, there's not anything he can do about it. True. Right? There's not anything he can do about well, it. Well, this is still against the law, right? No. You can shoot needles any place? No, you can exchange, no, you can exchange, exchange needles, needles any place. So you can take it to where to exchange the needles? So the, the way the law works right now is that under this executive order right. business we're in, the rules have been lightened so you can carry multiple needles. You used right. to, have to have a limit of 10, yeah. now there's no limit. And yeah. you can do it through the mail. Mm -hmm. And so a, a, a group like Main Access Points can put clean needles in the trunk of their car go to the Main Street playground, text everybody on Facebook that they know and say, if you want clean needles, I'll be here between three and five. You could do that right now, legally. Wow. So if 
Do you want the town manager to craft a, a ordinance that says we don't want that here? Right. We've got to find out if it's legal first, but if you want them to, to craft that, then let's let's change direction, I guess. I mean, we're, we were, by, in my opinion, by having this ordinance, Scout Hegan is trying to control where these people can be. Right. All right? And, and so, if, as again, as I said, if, if they show up tomorrow in his office and say, we're going to be at the playground or we're going to be at, at uh, the mill parking lot or any place like that, we're, we're, there's nothing he can do about it. They're going to be there. And if it's not in, the, in, not in the pandemic time or emergency orders, what are the rules then? Well, that's where once the state of emergency is lifted, then I think it's up to the legislature to decide how many of these executive orders stay. And, and that, that's going to be an interesting time. Yeah. All right, so I mean, is that something we wanted to look into and to just simply a bit of um, saying, no, you can't be here? Yeah. That's what I want. I, I, I certainly can look into the prohibition right. see if it's See if it's legal. Yep. And I can report back. So can somebody see and take pictures of the people who are changing needles? Probably. I have a lot of pictures today, Mr. Gopian. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have some direction. Thank you. All right. Well, let's look at number three. Discuss land at least with Somerset Woods Trust Western property. I kind of got these things out of order in your packets, forgive me. So this is actually new business number four, but we're doing it according to the agenda. So we're talking about Somerset Woods trustees, the Weston Woods and, and Waters. Um, I don't know if everybody was on the board when Ernie Hilton came and gave a presentation, but is everybody familiar with this track of land? This is the old Weston property, about 330 acres. Somerset Woods trustees received a Land for Maine Futures grant to purchase the land so they now own it. And if you've been down Weston Avenue, uh, I think past uh, John Noy's property, you can actually see the trailheads that they've developed. Um, so they're, they're, they're working hard to try to develop this property. And they came to the town several months ago now, I think this was back in May and June, uh, to propose that the town lease the property from Somerset Woods trustees for a dollar a year and that would allow the town to be able to add this property to the town's liability insurance, something that Somerset Woods Trustees is not set up to do uh, at this point. So Ernie Hilton uh, and Somerset Woods Trustees drafted a lease. Um, we took it and went to Maine Municipal and had Maine Municipal review it. They had some questions. One of their questions was, has this been reviewed by your town attorney? So we went to Ken Lexier over in Skowhegan, who does a lot of work for us. He reviewed it. It was good because he came up with a lot of the same questions that MMA did. And so we sent all that information back to Ernie Hilton, and he has reworked the lease. So what you have in front of you now is the second or third draft uh, of this lease, and it deals with maintenance, motorized vehicles, parking, hunting, and fishing. And you see if... If you're looking at the notes that I put together in the front, uh, you're more than welcome to review the whole lease, but it, it's only three pages long. Um, it does talk about the fact that Somerset Woods Trustees is responsible for maintenance, and they may add additional property to this package of properties for parking. ATVs are not allowed. Snowmobiles are only allowed on the marked trails, and Somerset Woods Trustees is responsible for governing that. It's not the town's responsibility for chasing off ATVs and snowmobiles that are on the trail. Somerset Woods Trustees is responsible for that. Hunting and fishing are allowed on the property. Um, and this does not put an undue burden on the town to add this to our liability insurance. It's only, it's less than $200 a year to add this to our insurance. And I would also say that I know that the school system and Somerset Woods Trustees are working, try to cooperatively use these trails for like cross country events. And that sort of thing. That is, high school cross country is now using them. Um, they've marked it out with their tape, and they're using the trails. And the poor kids got to have some. Got a lot of stumps in there, so hopefully they can get over them. <laughs> Hang on, on their face. But that's, well, 
them to figure out, I guess. So at this point, I feel comfortable recommending this to be approved by the board. All right, we're looking for a motion to accept the land lease with Somerset Woods trustees. I make a motion to accept it. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to, to accept the land lease with Somerset Woods trustees for the Western Woods and Waters. Um, any questions? Mr. Moody. Yeah, this last sentence, uh, this is uh, as far as the insurance goes, municipalities are exempt from many cases of liability through the Maine's Tort Reform Act. Mm -hmm. What cases aren't exempt from it? So, the Tort Reform Act basically gives all municipalities liability. Someone's walking down Main Street and trips over a hole in the sidewalk. Yep. And they go to the doctor and spend a thousand dollars in the doctor's office. The town is not liable for their medical bills. <laughs> However, if the town becomes aware of that hole in the sidewalk and does not fix it or put a cone there, then the town becomes liable. And, and, and I understand that wholeheartedly, but the way this reads, there seems to be some cases that the town would be liable for. So what you're reading is not the agreement. What you're reading is my notes yeah. to, to the agreement. Yeah, but and it's I, still I'm not, a, I'm, I, and I'm not a lawyer, and I can't tell you what the town would be liable for. But if someone falls down, yep. if someone falls off their snowmobile, if someone gets hit by an ATV, the town's not liable on this trip. So you, what we're, what we're, you're, what we're being asked here now is for this minimum cost of two hundred dollars a year for this insurance. Am I correct so far? By leasing it. By leasing it. Yeah. Now we have the ability to add it to our insurance, our and, liability insurance. And the benefit from that is mainly going to be for the school across right. country and things of that nature. The, well, I think it's going to be for the public use. Well, for, yeah. But the school is taking advantage the school of this. Is taking advantage of it, yeah. They use it for trailers too, and just walk on with the flowers, yeah, animals, yeah. whatever else it is. You can go up into the Western uh, Monument. It's quite interesting. It is quite hilly, so if you better kind of be ready. Mr. Road Commission. <clears throat> I think 25 years is a long time for at least. A lot can change in 25 years. Storms could go up, land can change hands, something to think about. It expires 2045. Should we look at 10 years or 15 years? It's so under terms of lease on page 2. Questions on that? I, I think Somerset Woods would, uh, trustees would say that 25 years is standard for these. They have several leases like this in the town of Skowhegan that are all 25-year leases. They're a conservation group. They don't plan on selling the land or changing it anytime soon. All right, so we have a motion and a second to accept the land lease with Somerset, Wood, Somerset Woods trustees. Any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? All opposed? All right, three to two, the motion carries. All right, number four, discuss continued support from, from TIFF for Lakewood Theater. I put together some notes in your packet for this as well under New Business 3. Um, so I did go out and I met with Jeff Quinn and Katie Quinn, the father and daughter that pretty much manage uh, Lakewood Inn and, and, uh, and Theater. Um, they were both very familiar and very thankful for the support. It was not something that they just assume that the town will do. It's not something that they just dumped into their operating fund. Uh, Jeff Quinn told me that they do earmark it for particular uh, maintenance and building projects. This year they spent it on painting the columns and, and painting and renovating the front uh, of the theater. In the past, they've used the money to jack up some of their 
uh, camps that are used for supporting children's programs. Um, he, did, he did say that they had been remiss about uh, putting it in their playbills, you know, thanks to the citizens of Madison or something like that. Um, and they would do that in the future. They'd also put it on their website as thanking the town of Madison along with their other, other supporters. Um, I spoke with Paul Fortin because this was his motion from, from three years ago. He said he still supports the idea as long as Lakewood is using them, the, the funds for upkeep of their building and property. He, does, he, he was not in favor of it just going into their general fund. Uh, and so I, I think that we could probably, um, you know, ask them for kind of a small summary report uh, every year as to what they spent the funds on, and that, that might be sufficient. Any questions? Is that any reason this ain't they're like the rest of the matching grants where they're putting in the same amount to improve their businesses? When I went back to the notes, I thought this came up under the discussion of matching grants. And to, to clarify, Lakewood Theater has re has applied for and received matching grants in the past for projects going back maybe four or five years ago. But this actually came up during a discussion of community organization requests, um, such as the Sea Cadets and the American Legion, the people who care food covered. That's where this conversation started, and Mr. Fortin said, I would like to add Lakewood Theater to this list of community programs that the town sponsors. Because it was taken out of TIF, it was never brought up during budget meetings for the advisory board because no, nothing under the TIF budget goes to the advisory board, it goes to you. It's the select. So that's kind of the history. Just to follow up on that, is that, is that in the list of associations in like the town report? The no, it's, that it's, it's, no, it's not. It's not. And that's, that is something that I'd be glad to change and, and document if you wanted to go, go that direction. I, I disagreed with it when this was initiated way back when, and, and I, guess, I guess I still disagree with it in, in my reasoning being that I think we're setting some kind of a precedence here. This, uh, you know, this is a, a situation where I think that if they want a, like, Mr. Savage said, if they want a matching grant, fine, we'll help them with a matching grant. But just to hand over a private entity, $5,000, I think I think we're setting a precedence. And how are you going to stop the next one? What are you going to say to them? Because Lakewood got one, I can't have one, or what's the reason? You know, it, it's just a big can of worms as far as I'm concerned. And I, I'm, I'm still not for it. Anyone would like to make a motion? I agree. I, I, I'm in support of Lakewood, the not-for-profit company and not-for-profit organization. They do bring a lot to the area, offering us some plays and, and um, the property in itself. And the, the, uh, the lake, um, they work really, really hard with very little money. I think I would like to make a motion that we continue to do it. Um, I will second it. Um, I think that if we don't vote on this, vote this in today, that we need to, we need to consider them in our list of um, organizations in, in budget season. Yep. Um, because I think that you know they are important. They should be considered important to us. Um, they do attract when they can get people into the building. They can attract people. And I know that I know the Lakewood Inn. The Lakewood Inn has had a successful season. Mm -hmm. So I mean I think those two the show and, and dinner is a big is a big thing. And so if they're applying this to their to their building, they're applying this to to fixing it up so it doesn't fall apart. I mean. A lot of history in the Lakewood Theater. I mean, I don't have any of it 
right now, but I mean we've all been here forever, so we we have that we have that history, and uh, nothing. Maybe maybe the the uh, in for lunch, but I mean I'm not a big play person, so I mean I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sit here and say I go every week because I don't, but I do I do support it. So I think I think our support for this year should be should be continued, and then let's let's tell them we're gonna put it in our in our um, organizations for next year, and have them write us a letter and tell us why. I mean, that's why we go with everybody else, right? We go everybody right yeah, everyone, that, everyone that gets on that list for community supports does write us a letter requesting. Yes. Mr. So. So Gopin, looks like you got something to say. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't they don't return a budget, right? We, we just give them the money and they do whatever they want, right? And that's the case with most, well, that's the case with all of the community services. Right. So if we put them on that list, they wouldn't have to come back with a budget. They don't come back with a budget. Uh, they, not a budget. I mean, come back with tell us why they need. That's that's budget. correct. They wouldn't have to what report they report on the use. Right. Right? We don't ask that of anybody else. Again, if you you or the advisory board wanted to, we could, but we, we don't do that currently. No. I I think yeah, I think there's a worthwhile program in the state, and then especially where we have in Madison, not Skyway, and secondly. Uh, Going out there, they have a lot of scenery out there. They have to keep painting and changing and everything else. They do a real good job, and they do put on some pretty good plays and performances. Uh, I wouldn't mind putting them in there either. Really? I'm, I'm not against the, that theater for us helping them out. I was against just handing them over $5,000 a year for no consideration whatsoever for the, for the other people or the other companies who want it. Whereas they are available for matching grants, you know, that, that we do give out there. And again, if you want to put them on that list that we have, you know, that is a lot better than just laying out $5,000. I think with, to me that would be, if I was a business owner, it, it would be kind of sour to me for somebody to do that. Well, you're not. I mean, you're talking a non-profit, right? You're talking a person group that's trying to that's trying to put on the show for you know what they have for money. They don't try to. They don't try to make a profit. I, I, so I'm it's not, not like a business. I'm not questioning that. I'm yep. just questioning the way they were getting the money. Yep. So, so my my understanding is that we we. If we can do this for this year and get them on that list and see if they can write us something to tell us why we can give them money and turn stop this after this year, I, I would go along with that. Okay, so that's, I don't think that's Mrs. Nope. Dwyer's motion. No, it's, it's I won't go along with that. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I'm, I'm just trying to get an idea what the motion is. When do we normally write this check? Whenever they request it, if they're on that organization. When do we normally write the five thousand to Lakewood? June. So Before we. my budget's done. We wrote it. We wrote it right at the end of the budget. Yeah, in June thirtieth. So as it stands right now, they would be due to get a check for five thousand dollars in, in June. June of twenty one. Yes. That's when they all get right? No. No. Everyone else is on that organization writes me a letter, and when yeah. they request it. The next warrant, I send out the check. But the, the town has to vote on it, right? Right. The town that, meeting. That's the difference. So right. if, yeah. you, if you were to say, okay, we were going to continue to offer support to Lakewood, you would have to vote to stop the automatic TIF payment and invite Lakewood to submit a letter for whatever amount they want to ask for. At, when they when they come before the advisory board, so now the way it's set up here is automatic. Mm -hmm. Comes right out of TIF. If you were to say we want to stop doing that and invite them to become a, compu a community uh, program or community uh, organization request, then that would have to pass the advisory board, the board of selectmen, and then town meeting. So at, at any one of those stages, that funding could be cut or eliminated altogether. That's the difference. So 
So. And, and the difference will also be that everybody knows that Lakewood's getting five thousand. Exactly. Exactly. Which I don't think is a bad thing. You, you, no, you want to be above. So, above we, board. So, so with our motion right now, we don't even need our motion we have right now. Because they're so, already going to get five thousand. Yeah. So the motion, as it was originally brought out, sounded like it was let's continue doing what we're doing. Right. Mm -hmm. In fact, you didn't even need that motion. Motion. If this board took no action tonight, according to 2017, we would continue doing this. Right. But if the board wants to change the practice. That would be, need to be the nature of the motion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we got to get rid of this motion, All right, correct? Yeah. We should retract it. So you have you have a motion, and, and you were the one that seconded. I, I believe if if the two I'll of you if the two of you retracted, that's well, fine. Kind of continues. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My memory serves me correctly. I remember years ago that they had asked for five thousand dollars at the town meeting. And I believe they got shot down to $2,500, if I remember right. I'm talking a long time ago. Is that the reason why we had gotten moved to TIF, you suppose, or? I don't know. I, I think. I, was, I, I don't believe I was here that night. You were not I don't here that night. No. It was, it, it, was, it was Mr. Fortin, Mr. Ducharm, and Mr. Edgeley in favor, and Mr. Moody opposed. Yeah. So it, it, this is a whole new board to discuss this. Right. At, at this point, and I, I believe the, kind of like what Jeff was alluding to, I believe the board at that time decided this would be a faster, easier way to support Lakewood. I think the intent was the same. We know Lakewood is a treasure for our community. We want to support it as a town. But the way they did it, went about it, it was the same as we're automatically going to give money to the Lakewood Theater, just like we automatically give TIF money to Madison Anson Days, and we automatically give TIF money to the Christmas celebration. So I think that's where it got lumped into what they could consider attraction events mm -hmm. that would draw people to the community. So that's where, that's where it, and, and if this board now wants to move it out of that and into community <laughs> programs, that's what you'd have to motion and discuss. All right, I, I'll give you my two cents and then I'll call on Mr. Moody, sorry. Mm -hmm. But I, I would like to see us continue with that for this year and so that would come out in, in June of 2021, yes. is that correct? And then let them know this year that we will be putting them in with the other community programs and they need to give us some documentation on what they would, on reasons why they need it. Not what they, not what they need it for, but reasons right. why they might need money so we can put it into community programs. Okay. And that shifts it from TIF to uh, tax dollars. Right. And the public can decide what they want to do with it. Okay. Mr. Moody. I can live with that, Al. All right, thank you. And, and, and I like the reason I like it is you, now you have uniformity. They're right there in those programs with the right. rest of the people. They're not out here by themselves. All right. And we can justify it easier. So do we need a motion to do that? So I'm writing it right now. So I don't think you need a motion now because we're not going to do anything. Well, you, you, so you, do need a, you do need a motion to stop the ongoing automatic TIF spending. Yeah, you should do that in June. You, you going to remember? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. You missed the motion to have us go to the first of next year? What's that? Can you make a motion so it stops July 1st of 2021? Yep, I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. I'll make that motion. The automatic TIF. Yes, sir. Well, I like the theater stops on July, July 1. 2021. So, or you could do this. <laughs> Mr. Savage could motion to to move support for Lakewood Theater from TIF to community services effective July 1. Okay. Does that sound good? Okay. That sounds fantastic. All right, we have a second. That was a great motion. That. All right. <laughs> seeing, uh, seeing no other questions, all those in favor? All in favor, the motion carries. Uh, right. One unanimous vote tonight. Yeah. <laughs> All right, selectman's concerns. Mr. Savage? No, Mr. Black? No, Mr. Gopi? No. Um, Mr. Moody? You've heard of all. <laughs> Citizens? All for All right, a motion to adjourn? So moved. Sir? So moved. motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor? All in favor, the motion carries. We're adjourned at 7.